In the song Reflection by the band Tool, the narrator experiences a revelation. The moon tells me a secret My confidant Is full and bright and Later, he sings of crucifying the ego, and so we know that in the moon, he's found a fitting image for an individualized self that realizes its source in some greater being, call it God, or as the Christian Gnostics did, the parent of the entirety. With that in mind, it's fitting that Christoph, so-called conceiver and creator of the television show, The Truman Show, operates as command center in the moon of the show's enormous set. He too is a mere reflection, not a true source, only he seems hardly likely to ever realize it. Ialtabeat, the demented creator god of the Gnostic myth, also exhibits the very same sort of vanity and confusion. The Gnostics were a Christian community that thrived for several hundred years after the death of Jesus. Though they were diverse, they generally agreed on two things. First, that Jesus was a messenger and not a redeemer or a savior. Second, that it is possible to know God directly by achieving a mystical state called gnosis, a word that shares a root with the English word know. In the film The Truman Show, we see the titular character traverse an arc that is strikingly similar to that of a Gnostic Christian. We meet a lot of characters who, though their names may be different, have the same nature and function. We also see Truman struggling to find meaning in a false world, an experience a Gnostic would be very familiar with. As the movie begins, we meet Truman just as a stage light comes crashing down on the street in front of his house. Right from the start, we learn that the world that Kristoff has created for Truman is flawed. Kristoff can only offer set pieces, movie versions of the real thing. It's a false world that Truman finds increasingly unfulfilling, and as we'll see, It's separated from the real one by water. In the defining myth of a certain group of Gnostics called Sethians, water also divides the real world from the false one. Ialtabeat, the creator of the sensible world that you and I know, lives on the dark side, where his mother, Sophia, an eternal heavenly being, cast him after his birth. She had sought to create something of her own will without the consent of God. Ialtabeat was the result a deformed being described as serpentine, with a lion's face, and with its eyes gleaming like flashes of lightning. Not only does the abortion survive, but he goes on to steal some of his mother's power. In the water that separates him from heaven, Ialtabiat can only see reflections of pure and perfect archetypes. Using his stolen power, He creates the world from these reflections. The story of Sophia did not end in shame. When she realized her son did not come to exist perfectly, she repented with much weeping. Thus began a sort of move, counter move, between Sophia and her cohorts in heaven and Ialtabeat and his rulers. Heaven fights for the empowerment and liberation of primordial man, while Ialtabeat struggles to maintain dominance on his side of the firmament. It's a conflict we see mirrored in The Truman Show, the same kind of players vying for the same sort of stakes. After the fallen star, Truman begins his normal workday. It doesn't take long before we see another crack in the ho-hum facade of the show. Pretending to his co-workers that he's on the line with a client, we find that he's talking to an operator. Do you have a Sylvia Garland? As for Sylvia. Though Truman is currently married to Meryl, it's Sylvia, who plays the character of Lauren in the show, that first catches a young Truman's eye. We soon learn that Sylvia's interest in Truman goes beyond mere romance when she breaks character to share a message of truth. They're here. Truman. What do they want? Listen to me. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows everything you do. They're pretending, Truman. Do do you understand? Everybody's pretending. I don't know. No, no, no. We find that Sylvia has a counterpart in the Sethian Gnostic myth. She arrives after Ialtabeat had created primordial man in the same flawed manner in which he had created the world. 
he named him Adam and planned to use his name as a magical invocation. His plans are thwarted when Sophia, seeking to redeem the power that was stolen from her by her demented offspring, asks Barbilo for help. Unlike the surviving brand of Christianity, in Gnosticism, the Holy Trinity is the Father, the Mother, and the Son. Barbilo is this primordial mother. And when supplicated by Sophia, Barbilo sends her son, Christ, an eternal being of which the later figure of Jesus is only an embodiment. He commands Ialtabeoth to share his power with Adam, and he does just that. Now imbued with Sophia's power, Adam exceeds the powers that created him. Feeling threatened, Ialtabeoth hits back. Barbilo responds by sending a messenger named Zoe, a Greek word meaning life, who is an aspect of Sophia. Zoe teaches Adam of his descent and also about the way of ascent. Kristoff shows his own ingenious aptitude for creating snares, in virtually every case leveraging Truman's good nature. After Sylvia's own descent, revelation, and violent departure back to the real world, Truman's mother was made to fall ill. His love for her kept him from chasing after Sylvia. All throughout his life, Truman's greatest influence has been his best friend Marlon, who almost solely exists to gaslight Truman. One day, after hearing a voice on the radio describing his every move, Truman decides to defy his programming. He approaches, but then turns away from his office building. He wanders around, observing. Seated at a nearby fountain, he peers around as if seeing the world in a new way. Does it appear too perfect? The lines too sharp? The colors too bright? Does it look too much like the commercials he sees on TV? Kristoff and his crew struggle to keep up with Truman as he effectively goes off script, a sequence that culminates when Truman discovers that an elevator in an adjacent building isn't what it seems. He is understandably disturbed. Unfortunately, he now turns to someone he trusts, his best friend Marlon, who does his best to convince his friend that he'd be crazy to think that Sea Haven isn't paradise. It's an argument lost on Truman. The very next day, he does everything he can to make it off the island. We are left with the enduring image of him sitting alone on a disabled bus after the driver has deliberately ruined the engine. The Truman Show organizes along the subtle yet powerful symbol of the wheel, it's a symbol implicitly invoked in the Gnostic myth as well, with the failure to achieve gnosis resulting in reincarnation of the spirit. For Truman, it represents the inescapability of Sea Haven and the superficiality of life there. The wheel is also literal. Every pathway out of town seems to somehow bring him back to where he started. Truman is waking up, though. In the beginning of the movie, he only hesitates before entering the revolving doors of his office. Sometime later, he enters those doors, but comes right back out and for a moment is free. After the bus breaks down and Truman fails to escape the island through more conventional means, he becomes fully conscious of the circuitous nature of his reality. He coaxes Meryl into the car and then explains to her how the activity in their neighborhood runs on a loop. I predict that in just a moment, we will see a lady on a red bike followed by a man with flowers and a Volkswagen Beetle with a dented fender. He even articulates the miserable state of his existence. They just go around and around. And then drives several times along a roundabout as if to emphasize his fate. Truman realizes what he needs to do, drive in a straight line. But after forcing his wife to negotiate a bridge because Truman has been programmed to fear water, and after literally driving through a wall of fire, Truman finally ends up stymied by an alleged chemical spill. When a friendly cop he's never met happily calls him by name, Truman appears utterly convinced that his world is false. He makes a futile dash for freedom only to be wrestled to the ground as he cries out in agony. Back at home and at his wit's end, Truman lashes out at Merrill and soon appears poised to do her violence. It's here that Kristoff trots out his greatest ploy yet. Truman's TV dad drowned during a sailing trip when Truman was a child, 
an event designed to traumatize Truman and instill a fear of water in him. The actor who played his father, feeling bitter about having been written out of the show, sneaks back onto the set and attempts to reconnect with Truman. For Truman, his sudden reappearance is yet another event that makes him wonder if things really are what they seem. Now, after Marlon has gotten him away from Merrill, and after Marlon has lied to him so profoundly that it's almost hard to watch, his father appears out of the mist. Called a masterstroke by journalists, Kristoff has written Truman's father back into the show. Kristoff directs the reunion scene, appearing almost intoxicated by his own power. He feels confident that he's again won the battle for Truman's soul. It's all an attempt by Kristoff to control Truman's fate. In the Gnostic myth, Ialtabeat created fate in order to entrap those destined for salvation. He and his fellow rulers raped Sophia, and as a result, destiny was begotten as bitterness. By their act, they made all creation blind so that Gnosis could not be achieved. But is Truman's fate sealed? Kristoff does not seem to understand a couple of things. First of all, that in his arrogance, he may have potentially undone Truman's fear of water. Secondly, that Truman is a true man, a member of a special race of human beings called the posterity of Seth. As Kristoff says in the beginning of the film, While the world he inhabits is in some respects counterfeit, there's nothing fake about Truman himself. Gnostic myths often revise biblical history. For example, Eve is not created from Adam's rib, but from Adam's divine spark, the power that Ealtabaiot was forced to share with him. Cain and Abel are the offspring of Ealtabaiot and Eve. The offspring of Adam and Eve is Seth, and he is the first true Gnostic. He is the father of the immovable race upon whom the spirit of life will descend and dwell with power. For Gnostics, salvation is found in achieving gnosis, or acquaintance with God. It's a mystical disclosure of one's divine nature, the discovery that you are an eternal spirit with membership in heaven, the realization that in some part of you, you are your source, which is immeasurable light, not corporeal, not incorporeal. For any human being, the potential to achieve Gnosis depends on one's pseudo-genetic heritage. Just as the bond of forgetfulness is hardly an obstacle to Gnosis for any committed Gnostic, it would seem that Truman doesn't believe the man that drowned and then reappeared is his father. Kristoff's masterstroke fails. And just as Ialtabeat feared Adam's intelligence, Truman outwits his own false creator. Apparently knowing just where the cameras were placed, Truman sneaks away one night without detection. Kristoff and crew undertake a massive search that sees Kristoff cueing the sunrise in the middle of the night. When Truman finally reappears, we see him happy and as he always envisioned himself, an explorer. He has with him a completed collage of Sylvia, his messenger of truth, something to inspire him as he approaches the edge of the world. We discover Kristoff and Truman as they really are in the movie's pitch-perfect climax. Kristoff, no longer merely the creator and director of a television show, reveals himself to be a wrathful deity, hell-bent on punishing anyone who would dare defy him. He commands the weather, calling down lightning bolt after lightning bolt upon that whom he clearly believes to be his own creation. Meanwhile, Truman displays unshakable resolution, just like Euratomus, the archetype of the perfect human being in the Gnostic myth, whose name in Greek means steel or unyielding. You're gonna have to kill me! Eventually, Kristoff relents, not wanting to kill off his own creation. Truman has prevailed, and he sails on, seemingly unperturbed, until his bowsprit crashes through the outer wall of the set. <laughs> It's not long before that hole in the wall triggers a dramatic catharsis. Truman realizes he's not crazy, that there was indeed something profoundly wrong with the world in which he lived. 
and that Sylvia had told him the truth. He was right to have believed in her all that time. In a final, desperate appeal, Kristoff speaks to Truman like a god might, in a booming voice that comes from the sky, and he lies. There's no more truth out there than there is in the world I created for you. He's oblivious. He doesn't even know that he doesn't know the true nature of Truman. Kristoff's vanity never fades. It's here that we see Sylvia, ever faithful, praying to God, only she's not wearing the pin she wore when she first met Truman. I was wondering that myself. <laughs> the key to the end is Did in the beginning, wanna... as Kristoff himself tells us. He was uh, curious from birth. <laughs> You're premature by two weeks. It was almost as if he couldn't wait to get started. Sadly, he left his mother's womb only to enter another kind of matrix, a lifeless world without meaning or depth, presided over by a man with a god complex. Now he has achieved gnosis, and just like he left that watery world at birth, he will depart this one as well, but not before offering a little kindness and cheer to the demented creator that sought to entrap his soul forever. In case I don't see ya. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night.